Hi, I'm Michael Miller. I'm going to be covering the part two of this session on best management practices for reducing visibility of electrical transmission features and pipeline corridors, mainly focusing on electrical transmission features. And I'll be discussing these topics in, in this order. So we'll be talking a little bit about the transmission cost impacts with line routing, uh, available coatings with some examples, structure types, aesthetics, and visual impacts to view sheds, and then some available resources. So if we think about line routing, um, many of the lines in the US uh, are, are older lines. Um, and you can see this particular photo that I took out of the window of a plane uh, of Mount Hood. And you can see through the, the national forest is, is the, the forested area here. And this line cuts right through the, the Mount Hood National Forest. And so uh, this was built in the, back in the 70s. And so um, it's a, it was a lot easier back then to build lines, of course, but you can see the impact on the, on the landscape. And you, you know, everyone's aware of this. There's a lot of impacts with the landscape. And on that, if you take a look at planning for transmission lines and, and uh, planners tend to like straight lines because they minimize the cost. But if this particular line is, uh, is shown here prior to the construction, and then after the construction, you not only have the main line, uh, uh, but you also have access roads. And that also should be taken into consideration when planning lines and, and locations of lines. So it's not only the impact of the line itself, but it's the access roads. The, uh, for this line, there's uh, just in general terms, there's two basic structure types that, uh, and, and this is important because of the cost, um, structure types, now this is just a lattice structure. It could be a pole, it could be anything, but, but uh, there's suspension and there's dead end. And in general, the rule of thumb is that the dead end structures are five to seven times the cost of the suspension structures. Hence, that's why utilities don't like to make modifica modifications to the line uh, right of way arrangement, alignment, uh, putting in more and more uh, angles and breaking up the line costs more money. So, so that's why there's a pushback generally uh, for any changes to certain routes, but they do accommodate uh, and, and have done so, um, do so more and more these days, accommodate landowners and others that, um, that want to avoid structures in their properties. This particular plot or uh, photo is from Google Earth, and um, this is along the Columbia, but it's um, the Columbia River in Wa Oregon State with Washington State on the other side of the river. And you can see the two uh, highways, Highway 84 and Highway um, uh, 14 on the other side of the road. And you can see along the ridge line, there's a, uh, if I draw the ridge line in red, and I draw the, the transmission lines that were placed in the 70s and 80s uh, in blue, you can see they placed those structures, those lines on the downhill side away from the public. So when you look at the line from the Washington side, you look at the hillside, you see this view. And so you can't see the line. And so that's, that's, that's another kind of a basic, it might be more common sense, but clearly uh, something important to do is to locate the lines on the other sides of hills on ridgetops so that they're obscured from the public if possible. And that's been done for many, many decades. Uh, other things that have been done in the past are um, different selections. So this line is the same transmission line, but different areas. Uh, with a, using lattice and also using tubular steel pole, weathering steel pole, uh, both a double circuit, 500,000 volts. Uh, this one's in Montana, and there was an area that uh, the public asked for uh, different options. They didn't want the lattice towers. And this, this happened, this has been going on for a long time. So this, is, this particular project was in the 80s. And, uh, and so 
there are a lot of different options and I'll go through some of those in a minute, but looking how it looks in the landscape is uh, you can see there's some homes and they didn't really want the lattice. And so, but you can really see those poles. These are very large poles. I think they're about 10 feet, nine feet to 10 feet in diameter at the base. So very large, you can see them from, you know, five, 10 miles away, easy. Um, then there's the, the lattice, which more or less blends into the environment in some ways. This is a different area in the line, but, but, um, so there's those considerations. Lattice tends to blend, um, poles tend to stick out, but uh, when public, when the public is given a chance to choose between one or the other, they tend to choose the poles, perhaps because they're more used to poles. Um, and, and it's also, um, in the U.S., there's also a lot of, uh, a lot more pole manufacturing plants than there are uh, lattice manufacturing plants, uh, which has changed from the past. So there's a lot more poles being built today than lattice. Um, at higher voltages, even 765, you can see this is an example of, of the line view shed here, um, kind of blending in. You don't really see, even though you, you're looking right down the line, it's difficult to, to really see that uh, tower there. Now contrast that with this, and this is a photo from uh, BPA Grand Coulee Dam, which is in Eastern Washington state. Uh, going out of the dam, there are just as many lattice towers as tubular steel poles, uh, but you can see the poles really stand out. So this, the poles were actually designed and developed and installed in the 60s when uh, the Johnson administration, remember the, uh, the Beautification Act. During that Beautification Act, there was a highway, really it focused on highway beautification, but, but uh, as fed federal agencies uh, under the Department of Energy at the time, they, they uh, uh, were also uh, highly encouraged to develop some nicer looking structures. Uh, but they do stand out. So you can see the difference. You can see the lattice kind of blending in and the, and the poles really standing out. Of course, they're painted also. And now I'll talk about a little bit of the available corrosion protection, which also is associated with the visual characteristics or visual impacts. So it goes hand in hand, the corrosion protection and the visual impact um, choices for some of these structures. So there's obviously paint um, and there's a couple different types of paint, different styles of, of paint, painting, but What's important about all of these that I'll go through is the time of first maintenance. And that's the time that it takes until you really have to start thinking about going back and in this case, repainting these structures, touching up and things like that. So three to five years for regular primer black steel paint. That's black steel, that's a steel that's, that's, that's how it's after it's fabricated with no coating, uh, then putting a primer on it and then painting it. Uh, painting a duplex coating is a is a painting over the galvanized steel. So it's first it's galvanized, hot dip galvanized, and then that paint lasts a little longer. Uh, plus the galvanizing lasts longer, but it starts to starts to flake off, and it uh, you really need it needs to be touched up after a, after a period of time. And what that looks like uh, painting, and uh, some utilities do a lot of painting. Uh, You've seen, I'm sure, some some structure, some of these examples. This particular one is in Hawaii, where they like to blend into the green environment. Uh, they use a lot of painted structures there. They've also have some some uh, more uh, tree bark type looking uh, surfaces that are painted that look they're supposed to simulate tree bark. Um, and then there's the pro uh, proprietary base coatings and. Right now, um, there's right now there in the industry is a coating called Natina, and uh, that that particular coating though it's been used on a few projects in the U.S. Uh, it's highly dependent on or the, the time to first maintenance is highly dependent on the quality of the application. It does cost more, uh, and and so really depends on how it's applied. It can't be painted after it's installed, it really needs to be painted in a, in a controlled environment, um, you know, vertically, piece by piece on the ground, let cured or let dried, and then 
and then packed and and uh, and uh, erected, assembled on the site. So it's a little different process, and it's only been used by a few utilities, but it is available. Then there's the weathering steel, which a lot of poles are in the US. Uh, weathering steel, it requires a, a flat continuous surface. And I'm, I'm bringing these things up just so you understand, um, so everyone understands what's involved with just the decision making to make a color or to make a surface. Now, they're always this reddish brownish color, which is the patina, which is really a surface of rust that, that actually uh, rust fairly quickly after it's installed and then that surface, that surface layer of rust actually protects the steel because it's a, it's a, uh, a certain type of steel that uh, inhibits corrosion after it has that first layer of rust on it. And, but it does require specific uh, conditions. If you have high humidity, then it doesn't last as long. And it's only good really for tubular steel poles. If you try it with lattice steel towers, there's a very shortened uh, service life where you get a condition called pack out, where, where the rust kind of builds on surfaces and lattice towers have a lot of connections and those connections uh, can trap moisture and water. And uh, that's pretty detrimental. Um, also, this, this photo is it's interesting because it's in an irrigated field. And of course, water is not so good with the surface. It, if this water is continuously used, uh, you'll get this, this will continue to corrode. The structure will continue to corrode at the base. So there are issues with its use. And, uh, but um, in a perfect environment, such as an arid environment, very dry, it'll last for 30 to 50 years, maybe even more. Then there's spun concrete cast poles and you can dye those poles to make different colors. Um, concrete is a, a fairly economical um, solution. It's uh, spun cast, which means it's very hard, very strong, um, and it has steel inside. So pre uh, has, has pretension strands in there, giving it the strength. So, um, and it can last for 30 to 50 years also. Then there's the more common, which is uh, galvanized and dulled, okay? Uh, or just galvanized. So uh, galvanized is hot dipped galvanizing. That's taking the steel and putting it in a, a molten zinc bath at about 750 degrees Celsius, very hot. Um, and, but you can get a dulled finish on top of that. So that's after the, the process is complete, you can actually deglare the surface of the, of the steel, of the galvanizing. And so as, instead of a bright, shiny finish, it's a, it's a darker finish and you can select the uh, reflectivity and tailor make this. And, and several lines were built recently in California over the last say five, seven years um, Tehachapi renewable projects, all of those lines were different variations and shades of color, uh, shades of, of darkness, of, of dulled steel. And it has a, a longer service life. And so, you know, anything galvanized, of course, it's, it's uh, the time to first maintenance time period is much longer. And it has been used a very long time in the industry. What it really looks like is here, and so you can see the um, what what's shown here is bundled steel that's delivered tower steel, and then a couple of pieces that were replaced but did were not dulled. Okay, this is the standard color of the steel, and uh, this is the dulled steel. So to give you a contrast view of what that really looks like. Then there's some poles are so large that um, these are all hot dip galvanized except for this large one. Uh, it has to be metallized. It's so large that it won't fit in a typical galvanizing tank. And uh, this I think is uh, 10 or 12 feet in diameter at the base. And, and so uh, there's only one uh, kettle in the US that can handle that kind of size. So sometimes these are metallized, which is a, a, another different like darker color. It's similar in color to the galvanized, which are the other structures here. Conductor is another thing that can 
you can um, request or, or uh, utilities can request to have non-specular conductor, which, which is basically taking the shine off of the conductor. Okay, and that's um, the cost of that really is, is, yeah, it costs some, but it's not the end of the world. It's, it's within, I'd say one or 2% of the cost of the conductor. So one, one or 2%, a little more um, on, on average, I'd say. Uh, and the, uh, all that's done here is that uh, it's basically sandblasted uh, to take that sheen off uh, to make it not so shiny. And so it doesn't reflect light as much. So that's possible to do. This particular shot is again, the Columbia River Basin. Um, and uh, I think it's near, near uh, John Day Dam this particular shot. Then there's, uh, if we take structure types, aesthetics and visual impacts to view sheds, let's take a look at that. So if we think about uh, the, the artistic uh, architectural elements that goes into these things, these terms that are shown here are very, um, they're not used, they're, they're not being used very often. In other words, Engineers aren't used to using these types of terms. And so um, we're trying to change that in the, in the industry, but, uh, but, but generally these are the types of terms when we talk about aesthetics that, uh, that, that we're interested in conveying. And it is a new terminology for, for typical engineers that are dealing with stress and strain, uh, but it's more along the lines of architectural concepts. And what we can do and what has been done is things like shapes. So if we think about topology of the structure, geometry of the structure, we can do simple things that, that we normally don't think of uh, unless we're thinking about aesthetics. And so uh, here's one example where a DC line is, is told to, it looks a little better on the right if you make the wing, the, uh, the arms look like wings of a bird. And similarly, uh, here's some different structures. And incidentally, this is a delta configuration. Uh, this particular uh, configuration allows you to, to reduce the right of way. So when, when you use this type of, this is a single circuit structure, when you, you bring these phases in in, a, in this type of triangular configuration, you can actually reduce the right of way width. Sometimes that's done and sometimes that's not done, but, uh, but that's one of the advantages of using a delta configuration is a, a smaller right of way width, which of course impacts cost, uh, reduces cost for the, the land that's purchased or leased for the line. Uh, and then of course, what I said before, the, uh, the goal wings can be done to, to change the appearance and improve the appearance somewhat of the structure. Also, some typical straight arms on the left versus some curved arms on the right. These are fairly simple things that are done now that can be done, it can continually to, to be done, which have the public does have a say in. Uh, they may not realize it, but, but they do have a say in some of these decisions. They do have cost impacts. Some have more cost impacts than others, but, um, but they have been accommodated in the past. And since view sheds are most often public spaces, new ideas are being introduced today that provide a more public acceptance for these structures. And what would those be? Well, there's been some structures that look like this. I mean, these are glue laminated board wood structures uh, with steel on top and some variations. I'm just gonna go through a, a few of these. This is called the bold structure. It uh, looks kind of like an umbrella a little different. American Electric Power is uh, is has a uh, a patent on this particular design. Um, others are more um, somewhat landmark structures or an attempt to focus the public's attention on different things, such as a knot, a, a menorah uh, on the left, knot on the right, and and this knot is a, just a plastic sheath that looks like a knot, it's not steel. And then there's the more um, 
there's more commercial things like uh, Mickey Mouse on the left and Disney World. Um, then there's art, uh, some art things. This could be, um, this is like a, a sculpture. It could either be a sculpture, but it's actually a, a structural support. Then there's in uh, Canton, Ohio at the uh, Pro Football Hall of Fame, there's uh, these structures, of course. And then in, uh, if we go more international in Finland, this is another structure. And, and this is other, this is an attempt to, again, try to be more um, aesthetic. And some, you know, adding lights to, if they have to have a structure there, why not say light it up? And so that's, uh, again, this is a European design um, and it's used to lighten up all the structures have lights. Or place colored glass inside the, the uh, spaces of the structure. Then there's the, the, uh, more fantasy, right? Although on the right, that's just a real structure. In Hungary, there's a line that's called the jester. And it, uh, and then on the left, this is a, a simulation or it's not a real, but it's giving, giving ideas to the industry on what can be done possibly. There's other simulations. In fact, in, in Europe, they do a lot of competitions for structures. So if there's a public works that's being done or replaced, then they have competitions and they'll, uh, similar to like a bridge structure, a landmark structure here in the US have a competition, or at least we used to in the past, and, um, and then come up with a winner and then that winner is attempted to be built. And right now the one on the right here, uh, this Vistrup architect, architecture um, one is it's called a T pylon and it's being built in England or in, in parts of England. The one on the left is not just concept. Then I'm sure everyone has heard of the land of the giants structures. This won some awards, uh, conceptual awards for, for um, architecture. It has not been, been uh, completed yet or built yet, but it's an interesting idea uh, from the same architecture group uh, for wind towers, uh, wind seeds, and then giants of the wind, same kind of idea. Spindle towers, which are uh, taking the idea of a spindle and, and putting it into, you know, these are more fantasy type things, but still interesting to keep, to think about the possibilities. Uh, taking nature and, and modeling something after nature with the dandelion towers. And then something like the bamboo tower or the mantis tower or centipede tower. All three of these are quite interesting, uh, very unique, interesting ideas, perhaps not very applicable. Some vibration issues, I think, with some of these structures. And finally, with the uh, references, uh, these are a list of, of references. This was just recently published last year called Aesthetics Design, Aesthetic Design of Electrical Transmission Structures. It's available, ASCE, and in some recommended websites. And with that, I'll take some questions if we have time. <laughs>